Hello, hello everyone. This is Hall Simmer. I'm just getting everything loaded up, so if you'll hang in there just a bit, we'll get started soon. Uh, as this is loading up, I just want to welcome everybody to the Hall Simmer channel. This channel is designed for people who are brand new to flying an airplane. So if you loop beginner and you want to learn about flying an airplane, this is the place to be. Uh, in this channel, we will be focusing our flight training, as it were, uh, using the Cessna 152, which you see right now before you. Uh, I'm going to turn the sound down a little bit. So, I want to give a little background on the uh, channel and uh, just... Uh, again, let you know that this is for absolute beginners who are brand new to flying. If you are that person, this is the channel for you. If you are an experienced pilot or somebody who is uh, familiar with aviation and uh, concepts that center around flying, this will probably uh, be too uh, much of a beginner course for you. You're, you're beyond this and uh, I encourage you to look at other resources that would uh, be more at your higher level. But if you are brand new and you want to learn more, this is the place for you. And I'm going to center the training around the Cessna 152. Uh, I am I have just started this particular channel, so I am in the process of developing content. Uh, I tried this Friday night and realized that I had the graphics sitting over the screen the whole time. So I realized I needed to do a redo of what I covered Friday evening. So I am covering it again this evening and hoping that this time around uh, I do a better job of uh, uh, when I place the overlays and uh, that the timing is right. So anyway, I do want to jump right in uh, in just a minute or two um, wanted to also mention that I am still firming up the schedule I am initially because of the length of time it takes to create content for this channel I am initially thinking about uh, maybe twice or three times a week if I get enough content in place uh, might increase that but I would say probably for now two or three times a week so refer back to the schedule. Uh, I will be trying to uh, get that firmed up as I consider how I might uh, work the schedule in with other things that are going on. So keep that in mind. With that said, this flight training that I'm going to do is going to center, as I said, around the Cessna 152. The Cessna 152 is a very um, a good airplane to start with because uh, if you look inside the cockpit you see that the uh, instrument panel even if you're a beginner and it looks somewhat intimidating it is actually a uh, uh, easier cockpit to get your mind around versus say some of the other aircraft that have more uh, gauges and knobs and buttons and things to push and the glass cockpits uh, are great as well, and obviously a lot of the uh, modern aircraft are using uh, Garmin, G1000, or other um, GPS um, solutions to help you to navigate and get from one place to another very easily. But this is a, a great plane uh, just because you're forced to fly with it. What I mean by that is it does not have a uh, autopilot built in so you can't rely on autopilot and just let the uh, air, airplane take over. Um, so this forces you to fly and it forces you to learn how to fly and how to do maneuvers and uh, so we are going to talk about all that as we get uh, as I get content put together. What I thought I would do this evening uh, to start off is give you a little background on this particular uh, aircraft. So 
Uh, first off, this airplane is a two-seater, the Cessna 152, as you can see right here. There's not a seat behind. That looks like a seat, I know, but it's considered a two-seater <laughs> two aircraft. Uh, and it, it uses a Lycoming piston engine that has four cylinders. Now, what I want to do to talk about that a little bit more as I talk about the engine, um, I'm going to pull up a particular graphic so that you can see this. And so just give me a second while I select the screen and you should see, uh, I'm waiting for the, there it is. I'm waiting for the image to pop up and the graphic. And so this is, this is an example of a four stroke piston engine. And I wanna talk about it a bit so that you uh, get your mind around how this might work. Um, before I do that, I wanna find something to reference. Um, so as you look at this particular graphic, you'll see there's a belt and at the top you see like two, um, what look like gears, right? And then at the bottom, you see one, uh, the point of the triangle at the bottom and what that's connected to that is connected to that long rod okay and that rod is a crankshaft and what happens is that's spinning around it's turning around and if you look at the center of the graphic you'll see what is a connecting rod it kind of looks like a wrench you might think of it that way you'll see two of them that are visible and the center of the uh, engine. And by the way, the piston image, the piston engine obviously is a very common engine, not only used in aircraft, but also used in boats, uh, used in compressor, uh, compressors, uh, uh, used in just in all kinds of uses where the piston engine, cars, I forgot about cars, you know, that's an obvious use. And so it's you, motorcycles, um, all kinds of applications for the piston engine. So very common engine, obviously. This, uh, the piston engine that's in the Cessna 152 is four cylinders. So you'll see, if you count them, you see there's four. See those on the top of the rods, you have the, the pistons. And you see there's four of them, one, two, three, four, right? You can count them and they're those silver cylinder looking uh, things that are on the top of the rods and what's happening is as the crankshaft again that long rod that's at the bottom that the rods are connected to as it's spinning those uh, rods are that the and the pistons on top of the rods they're going up and down rapidly right so it's it's very quick and they're going up and down up and down up and down as the crankshaft is turning and so what's happening there's four things that are happening in each cylinder as i said there's four cylinders so if you look at the first uh cylinder the, the piston where you see the blue um sort of that blue color that's coming from the top what that's supposed to represent is air fuel mixture so there's a mixture of fuel and air that is pulled in and what happens is when that piston drops it's pulling in air and fuel from what's called a valve so if you look at the top you'll see all these valves uh, that are attached to two camshafts at the top or a camshaft at the top and on one side you have an intake valve and then on the other side you have the exhaust valve in a row so you have intake valves on one side and exhaust valves on the other and what happens when you have the air fuel mixture being pulled in the intake valve is uh, it opens in order for that to happen and so that is being pulled in and then what happens is of course the piston if, if you look at the 
third piston, for example, the piston is going upwards towards what's a spark plug. You see the white spark plugs. If you look at the graphic carefully, you see there's four spark plugs there above each piston. And so the piston, as it goes up towards the spark plug, it starts to compress the fuel air mixture. And what happens is then there's an ignition and that's that's called combustion. That is represented by the second piston that you see right above. You see that orange flame. So there's combustion that takes place. And what happens is when that controlled explosion, as it were, takes place, it pushes the piston back down and you have what's called exhaust. That's sort of represented by that fourth piston that is uh, the furthest away and you see the exhaust there and then that will be what happens is as the uh, exhaust valve at the top will open up and that exhaust will then as the, um, the the exhaust will then escape through the exhaust valve so that's kind of the last stage of that four stage um, cycle that goes over and over and over again uh, in a piston engine and so it's that combustion, that ignition from the spark plug that gives power to the engine. And all, there's all these, uh, and they're, of course, happening very rapidly. Um, and so you have power taking place there that allows, uh, provides power to the engine, which then, of course, turns the propeller. So that's kind of the four-stroke... Um, piston engine in a nutshell there is a video and as I get the resources put together I will try to put together some key links to help you get your mind around some of the concepts because there's a really good video in fact it's a, I did a still shot of the video if you watch the video um, it will it does a great job of helping you to understand how the piston engine works and I, I hope that this uh, explanation was somewhat helpful. So what I want to do next, I'm going to talk about some uh, other things about the Cessna 152 as background. So I need to switch screen again because I got that graphic covering things. Okay, so here we have an outside view of the Cessna 152, and one of the things I want to point out is as you look at it, you see that it has uh, what's called fixed tricycle landing gear. So in some airplanes, the gear retracts up into uh, the airplane so that you don't see it anymore. It just folds right in to the aircraft. In this case, it's fixed, so it does not retract. So the landing gear is always exposed and always visible, and that's why they call it fixed tricycle landing gear. And it's in a tricycle format where you have the one nose wheel and the two wheels, uh, the two main uh, wheels in the back there uh, that you want to touch down on first before you put the uh, nose gear down. Uh, we'll talk about that later, but that's fixed tricycle landing gear. And then you also have the uh, in the front the fixed pitch propeller that's spinning. Uh, on some airplanes, uh, it is not, you can rotate the blades uh, because you can make, uh, a blade takes out a bite of air, okay? And if you are taking off, the angle of the blade to the air is, is a bit different than if you're flying straight and level and if you're descending and all that. And so on some aircraft, what they do is they, um, 
give you the ability if I, if I were to go on the inside of this airplane you would see an additional next to the throttle which I'm which I'm pointing to right here next to the throttle there would be a blue um, uh, knob that you could pull out or push in that would adjust the angle of the propeller blades and what that does is it makes the bite, I'll call it the bite of air <laughs> that the blade does more efficient and it can be adjusted when you're taking off uh, when you're flying straight and level and when you're descending and so based on what you're doing uh, you can adjust the angle of the blade on those planes but on this plane the Cessna 152 it is a fixed propeller so you cannot do any adjustment it just they what they do is they come up with a compromise and basically adjust the blade to you know try to meet the most of the need of the aircraft as it were as it takes you know a kind of a compromise in the bite of air that it takes um, so they choose an angle that's best and I you know the engineers and those who design the plane come up with those figures and calculations I could not speak to that in uh, greater detail other than just at a high level this particular aircraft that we're looking at right now it uh, it arrived in 19 77 is when it was first manufactured and the last one was produced in 1985 so there was a total of 7,500 of these built and this particular plane just to cover the dimensions a little bit from the nose the length of it from the nose to the tail here is about 7.3 meters or 24.1 feet long the wingspan from over here to the left all the way over to the right is about 10.2 meters long or 33.4 feet and then the height of the aircraft from say the ground up to the top of the tail is about 2.6 meters or 8.6 feet high so that just wanted to give you some general dimensions of the aircraft so you have that just to give you a feel for the size of the aircraft so now I'm going to switch to another subject so bear with me So what I want to talk about next are what are called the V-speeds. So I'm going to find that and pull that up on screen. So I think it's showing up now. So you see all these, what I call V-speeds. V represents velocity or the speed of the aircraft and then uh, if you look at the first one you'll see 149 KIAS so what that means is 149 is 149 knots which is each knot is a little bit longer than a mile and then the IAS is indicated airspeed so if I go into the aircraft this is the right here is the air speed uh, oops let me take the graphic off for just a second so I'm gonna have to hop back and forth So, if you look at the airspeed indicator here, this 
this is the what it means by KIAS is indicated airspeed. It means the airspeed as you see it on the airspeed indicator. So what we're looking at here, we see 40 knots. This little line, every every notch is five knots uh, higher. So you have 40, and then you have 45, and then 50 knots, 55 knots, and then 60 here. So you see the 60, 65 knots, 70, 75 knots, 80, so forth and so on. 100 knots, 120 knots. So if you're in between, so right here, this would be 41 knots, 42 knots, 43, 44, 45, until you get to the 45, the first small little tick mark here. Um, so you have to sort of in your mind know, okay, approximately 42 knots is going to be right about here, and 43 is going to be in the center, somewhere between 40 and 45. Anyway, that is your um, airspeed indicator, and that's what it means when it says indicated airspeed. You have an airspeed that's indicated to you by this particular uh, uh, indicator. <laughs> so, to be redundant. So I'm going to switch back temporarily to the V-speed screen. And, you'll, and I want to focus on the first one. So we have V and E. And that means never exceed this speed. So what it's saying is never ever go past 149 knots. Because if you do, you can do structural damage to the aircraft. So what I want to do to show this, I'm going to actually demonstrate this uh, and why it's a bad idea. So I'm going to go back to the screen and temporarily remove that uh, table so it goes away. And I'm going to look at this again. So you see the red line right here. It's saying that is at 149 knots, basically. It's saying don't go, don't go there, basically. Don't ever go near here because you are likely to do structural damage to the aircraft. So so you never want to mess around with that. If you're just flying normally, it's very hard for this particular airplane to even get uh, close to that. But I'll show you an example of where you can. So what I'm going to do right now is hit the escape key. And I'm going to load a particular flight where I've climbed up to... Uh, let's see, I got five BME here. I've climbed up to about, I don't know, I think it was 7,000 feet. And that is going to load up. Now the pretty desert there somewhere. The scenery here in this simulator is absolutely outstanding. And they're making it better all the time as they put out updates. Uh, by the way, speaking of that, as this is loading up, you can apply this to any flight simulator. So I'm using Microsoft Flight Simulator uh, game in the game in the year version, but you can apply it to any other flight simulator, like Prepared, X Plane, uh, whatever, whatever. Uh, those are kind of the leading ones. That you might be using or you might be using the older fs flight simulator x which was a, a a prior older version of microsoft flight simulator but what i'm doing right now i am flying uh at 90 knots i'm over 7,000 uh feet and climbing and the reason i had to get this high is you need a lot of room <laughs> to do what i'm about to do so even if I'm at full power in this uh, airplane right now, you'll see that it's really hard for me. And let, let me make sure I don't have the flaps down. Yeah, okay. It's really hard to even get close, especially at this altitude, because as you climb, you tend to lose power. That's another subject for another time. But you'll see I'm not close to the, if I zoom in here, I'm not close to the 
red line right now. So I'm flying in the green, which is good. And however, there is a case where I can rapidly force it past the red line, and that is to purposely dive the plate. So I'm going to do that. I'm going to dive the plate. Watch that airspeed go up, and watch it go past the red line. And when I've done that, I have put the plate into a structural damage situation. And if Microsoft should, yep, Microsoft is basically saying, you've crashed this, you've not crashed it, you have uh, structurally damaged your plate. So I'm going to escape out of there. And to switch back. So that was VNE, never exceed speed. The next one is that is talking about on the table is VNO, which is the max cruising speed. So NO is normal operations. Uh, so there's under normal operations of the aircraft, um, your max cruising speed is up to 111 knots. So what I'm going to do is I am going to actually pick that so we can see that demonstrated. Because I want to talk about that a little more to make it a little more clear. And so actually, let me load. So we're talking about VNO right now. I did all this pre-setup because it just it's an easier way to jump to what we want to talk about instead of having to take off and set the airspeed and <laughs> do all that. And I am going to, while that's loading, change the screen again. So here we are, we're in the air, and if you look closely, what it's saying is under no normal operations, um, your maximum speed should be up to 111 knots. So here's 100 knots, 105 knots right there, 110. And right now we're flying just under that. So we're flying about 108 knots, 109 knots. So if I go a little bit faster, we're going to go into the yellow. Now, if the air, if the air is smooth and, you know, you got a smooth day, it's really calm and all is good then you are allowed to go into the yellow. You don't want to ever go here, but you're allowed to fly into the yellow a bit on a calm day. Again, the wind is smooth, there's, it's not turbulent, uh, all is good. But if the wind, you start to get wind gusts, it starts to get bumpy, and you have turbulence, you do not want to be in the yellow. You want to back it off into the green, and that's why on VNO, you don't want to go beyond 100 and really 100. You might as well just say 110. <laughs> uh, not go beyond 100. Basically beyond this line. You don't want to start going into the yellow. You want to stay off of that, especially if the wind is uh, choppy and you're bouncing, you're getting bounced around up there. So that's what VNO is. So what I want to do is go back to the table. And the next one you see is maneuvering speed. And you'll notice this can vary by the weight of the aircraft. So depending on how much fuel, how many people you have in the aircraft, well, max of two. <laughs> uh, and... Uh, baggage and other items you might have loaded into the aircraft, it will cause the weight to vary. And 
as an example, if the aircraft weighs 1,670 pounds, then you want to keep your maneuvering speed at 104 uh, knots. But if your aircraft weighs lighter at 1,350 pounds, then it recommends 93 knots. What I like to do, maneuvering, when we talk about maneuvering, we're talking about doing certain maneuvers because when you do maneuvers, turns, and other things, um, especially steep turns and other maneuvers, you're applying stress on the aircraft. You're also, uh, depending on what you're doing, can uh, potentially stall the aircraft. But anyway, you're putting stress. And again, if the air is uh, choppy, uh, if you got turbulence to some degree, uh, in other words, if it's not a smooth day, you could end up causing structural damage because you're putting certain forces on the aircraft as you're doing maneuvers. So what I like to do to just demonstrate this, I'm going to go back and take this particular table off again, is I might just go back to that same flight. So I'm just going to resume. By the way, make sure our flaps are off. Okay. So what I like to do right now, I'm flying at it right now at about 108, 109 knots. And what I like to do, even though it said, you know, 93 knots based on certain weight or, or even above that, I like to just fly at 90. I think that's a good rule of thumb is just back it off to 90. That's a good conservative number. So what I, what I will do is slow the aircraft down. And right now I'm slowing down to 100 knots. And, and then uh, when I get to about 90 knots, so it's getting there, right there at that mark. There I'm at 90. Right about there. That's a good place to start doing maneuvers, right there. So if I... You know, see, you can see about 90 knots. So I can begin to do my maneuvers in the aircraft, whether it's a turn or, you know, some other maneuver, especially steep turns. Uh, you know, I can start practicing those, and I'm not really paying attention to doing the technique right. But I can start doing my maneuvers in the aircraft and do them at, you know, do them at 90 knots or less and all that. So, um, uh, so that is a particular speed that you'll want to keep in mind. Again, by the way, these, uh, if I go back, let me hit escape. And if I go back to the table, which I'm going to do again, these speeds that we've been talking about could vary depending on the aircraft that you're using. So these, the speeds I'm giving you here, they just apply to the Cessna 152. They don't necessarily apply to other aircraft. They can vary depending on the aircraft you're flying. So I do want to mention that. The next one that we're going to look at is uh, VFE. And that is saying, this is the maximum speed you want to be at. But actually what I should say, you don't, you want to make sure you are not flying faster than 85 knots when it comes time to extend your flaps to start dropping your first notch of flaps. So uh, I'm going to demo that now. So keep that 85 knots in mind. So I got to switch screen again to remove that table. And it's gone now. All right. So we're going to load up VFE flight. Like that glacier.
Almost there, watching the progress bar. I usually don't have to flip back and forth so much, but in this example, I want to make things clear as I cover each of those V speeds. So, so if you look close closely at the airspeed indicator right here, right now we're flying at, I'll make sure I don't have any flaps on. So the flaps are off right there. We can see that. And the other way to tell is if we go over here, we see that we're at zero degree flaps right here. So we don't have the flaps set. But anyway, coming back here, what this is saying is, you see this white arc, the top of this, this is at 85 knots. And at the bottom here, we have 35 knots. So this is our, basically it's like 36 knots, but this is our flap, flap range right here. That's what that represents. So we want to make sure that before we extend flaps, we've slowed down to at least 85 knots right here. So if I back this off a little bit and I start to slow the plane down again so that I'm flying, try to back off the power just a bit. Now I'm at 85 knots, so what I can do then is go ahead and drop first knots of flaps. I'm free to do that, and then that will actually slow things down a little bit more. So you may have to make some adjustments. So right now I'm flying at uh, about 80 knots, which is fine. So if I go back outside of the aircraft, you'll see now I have that 10 degree notch of flaps down. And that's okay because I slowed down enough to where I can safely drop those flaps. If I'm going too fast and I do that, then I might do, I might have some structural damage done to the flaps. So I don't want to, you know, you want to be careful to make sure you slow down before you start extending your flaps. And then I want to just pause this momentarily and go back to the table. And the next one is VSO stall speed. So when it says right here, it says uh, you will reach stall speed at 35 knots landing configuration. So in a, in a airplane, when we see landing configuration, we're talking about full flaps and the landing gear is down. Of course, on our airplane, the landing gear is always down. But if, we're, if you remember, before we paused the flight, we were only at 10 degree flaps and you can take the flaps down to 30 degrees. So what this is saying is you will stall if you have full flaps as if you were coming in for a landing. Because when you have full flaps, you can uh, land at a slower speed without stalling the aircraft. However, if you go too slow, like in this case, 35 knots, you will go into a stall. So we'll demonstrate that next. That's what I'm going to show you. So I am going to, again, switch the, take this uh, graphic off. and it should disappear. So I keep that 35 knots in mind. I'm going to resume. So right now we're at uh, about just a little bit over 80 knots, about 82 knots. And, uh, and we, we're gonna try to slow it down till we get to this point. But before that, I'm going to go into full landing configuration. So right now we are only at 10 degree flaps. So I'm going to drop this down all the way to 30 degree. Let's see if you can see that 30 degree flaps down here. And when I've done that, oops, let me make sure I add a little power here because I don't want to stall just yet. Okay, we get this sort of stabilized because I want to 
go outside the airplane for just a second. So now this is landing configuration right there. You see I have full flaps. You see the flaps are down all the way. And of course my landing gear are down because they're always down. So this is landing configuration. So what that VSO is saying is if I come in here and I start to slow it down to where I go 35 knots or less, you'll start to hear the stall horn sound and I will end up stalling the aircraft. So passing, you see it here, the stall horn and it starts to stall. So I'm gonna add power to get out of that stall and then let it climb back up. By the way, stalling is part of what they will have you do in the real world. So if you wanna pursue a uh, pilot's license and do the real thing, instead of uh, learning via your flight simulator, uh, stalling will be a part of what you learn about. I, I, I am a flight simmer, not an actual flight instructor or CFI. I'm not a, a licensed pilot, but I've learned, I have learned from other pilots. So I'm just passing along what I've learned. Uh, and also from re reading a lot. So, but anyway, so that is VSO. And then I'm gonna go back to the, so I'm gonna escape here and go back to the chart again. And the next one we have is VY and VX. So these are used when you're taking off from the runway. And the VY, when it says 67 knots, is the best rate of climb. Uh, what that's talking about is when you're climbing, you want to be at 67 knots to climb the fastest rate uh, in order to reach a given uh, altitude where the best angle of climb at 55 knots, VX, is more of a um, the way to climb at the highest angle in order to uh, uh, avoid usually obstacles. So it's obstacle avoidance is usually what you're trying to accomplish with the best angle of climb. So what I'm going to do to show that a little further is I'm going to show another graphic so you can see that better. So the VY, the one on the right, is the best rate of climb airspeed. I believe, again, that was 67 knots. and so it gives the greatest altitude gain in the shortest time. So that's what best rate of climb is, VY versus VX. Again, used for obstacle avoidance, where it's the best angle of climb airspeed, VX, where you won't climb as, as uh, fast as the best rate, but you will get above the trees, as it were, or, or whatever else is in front of you that you need to get, get over as you're taking off. So the best angle of climb, VX, gives the greatest altitude gain in the shortest horizontal distance. So VX and VY is what this is. So I'm going to demo both of those starting off with, I'll do VY, best rate of climb, because... That's probably more common, but there are times where you'll have to do VX. So I am going to go ahead and load that particular flight so we can look at that one. So this is VY. While we're doing that, I'm going to take that graphic off. I know it takes a little bit to load in between all the, uh, as we're breaking the 
velocity, the V speed chart down, but uh, I hope it's helpful. I know uh, jumping back and forth is a little bit annoying because we have to wait for it to load, but forgive me for that. I am going to zoom in a little bit. So we, so in order to do VY or best rate of climb, we want to go a little bit above 65 knots. So 67 would, would be right about here, going a little further, right about there at that spot. So let's try it. Let's see if we can see how we might do this. So we're going to take off. We'll talk about takeoffs uh, in other lessons, but right now I'm just going to go ahead and uh, take off. I have to wait for it to pick up a certain level of airspeed before I let me make sure my flaps up there. Okay, I'm going to take off. And when I get towards 67, I want to raise the nose, so I'm trying to kind of hold that 67 right about there. That actually was a pretty good demonstration. Well, I went a little fast now. As soon as I said that, I went too fast. Now I'm at 70 knots, so I'm going to raise the nose. By the way, raise the nose to fly a little slower, lower the nose to go faster. And here we go. I'll raise the nose because I'm going a little too fast, but we're shooting for that 67. Let me zoom in so we can see that. It's a little hard. Lower the nose. There's 67 right, right, right there. Yep. Try to go a little right there, 67, right about there. So that, and you would try to, what you do is you'd use your trim wheel to trim for that particular airspeed. But, uh, so that's how that works. And then let's try the VX. So I'm going to reset the flight. I'll just resume. It should take me back to the, oops, stop resume. I need to restart. So that's, again, best rate of climb. Now we're going to do best angle of climb. So we're going to target 55 knots. Okay, so here we are. All right, I'm going to turn that sound down. Let's... Okay, so let me zoom in here so we can see this again. So for best angle of climb, this is 40 knots, 50, and then 55. So we are targeting this line right here for best angle of climb. So we're going to take off again. It's, the airspeed is increasing. Got 45, 50. Okay, we're going to go ahead and lift the nose. Now we're going a little fast, so now we need to raise that nose until we slow down to 59. I'm going to drop it just a little bit to try to get around 55 knots, which is right about there. So again, if I'm going too fast, I'm going to slightly increase pull back on the oak to increase right there. Right there is 55 knots. That is the best angle of climb. And again, I'm going a little fast, but you get the idea. I'm targeting basically right around there. Oops, now I'm going too slow, so lower the nose. Try to get there again. Right about there. So that is best angle of climb. Now I'm going to go back to the blue chart. And just mention a couple of other quick facts about the, the aircraft. And that is, um, this says that 
the Cessna 152 can climb as high as 14,700 feet. I'm not sure if that's not too high. Uh, it feels too high to me, but I could be wrong. But the point is, this airplane, it has some power, but it doesn't have a lot of power like other aircraft do, where they can get really high. Uh, 20,000 feet, your jets, obviously, or 30,000 and others, you know, above maybe even above that, but uh, this airplane doesn't have that kind of power. So you're never, ever going to be able to drift off into space because you're never going to be able to get there in the first place <laughs> because your ceiling is at, uh, according to this, 14,700 feet. So if that's correct, and I'm not 100% sure that is, um, you know, you're really going to struggle to get there. Um, because you're playing, you know, you're going to lose, um, oxygen and then that air fuel mixture, you know, you lose power as you go higher and higher. You have, you can adjust for that with what's called the, uh, mixture, uh, knob where you adjust the mixture setting that controls the ratio of, uh, fuel to air, but that's another topic for another time. But uh, just realize that uh, this is not one of those aircraft where you're going to get way up there. Uh, you might be able to get towards, uh, you know, above some of the, the Rocky Mountains, but uh, you might want to take something else for trips like that. So, uh, and then the range can vary. It says 590 nautical miles if you're flying 75% power at 8,000 feet. But there's all kinds of factors that can impact how far uh, your aircraft could go on a full take of gas. Um, and so that's, that's just a rough rule of thumb. Uh, and it's, I guess the point I want to make there is if you do the real thing and you go to a flight school, you're going to want to really um, do proper flight planning because you want to make sure you don't run out of gas, for example, in the air and get yourself in trouble. So there's, there's uh, planning done to avoid situations like that. So that is essentially the uh, table, at least covering that piece of it. And now what I want to do is jump to another topic. So give me a minute while I switch and talk about another topic, which is pitch, roll, and yaw. And so I am going to pull up that graphic. And that is coming up, pitch, roll, and yaw. So pitch is basically, you'll see there's a blue line. The plane is rotating around the pitch, that pitch uh, imaginary line. In other words, pitch is a way to have the nose of your plane point upward or downward. That's what pitch is. The nose is going up and down. Roll is, if you think of banking your aircraft or turning your aircraft and it's rolling to the right or it's rolling to the left as you're turning, that's what roll is. So you can picture that the plane is sort of, if you were to twist that red line, if you could put your thumb and think, you know, two hands, on both sides of that red line and just sort of roll it between your your thumb and finger you would see that you know the plane would be rolling either right or left depending on how you moved your your hand um, kind of like you were rolling a straw in your hand so rolling to the right rolling to the left and then yaw is sort of a twisting action and where you're twisting the plane either right or or left uh, by yawing the plane. So when you do flight maneuvers, you're using a combination of one or more of these. For example, when you're climbing, you're changing the pitch. For example, when you're turning, uh, if you're if it's a climbing turn, you're doing both pitch and roll, for example, because you're turning and climbing. That would be an example of uh, 
and maybe you're doing a coordinated turn, so uh, you're using a little bit of rudder, which controls the yaw, but uh, I, that might be a little bit off because you don't want to slip and skid the plane. That's another topic for another time. Anyway, that's the basic concept around pitch roll and yaw. What I'm going to do is demo those in the aircraft. Um, so I'm going to go back to that, take this graphic off. And I am going to load that particular flight that I want to use for that. Actually, before I do that, I wish I had not chosen that one. That's okay. We'll try to see if we can pull it off. You know what? I think I'm going to load that other. I'm going to load something else before I do this one. So forgive me for switching, but I think to make it more clear, I want to have the plane on the ground and not up in the air so we can see it a little better. So I am going to load uh, just, uh, I'll just use VX to, just so we start at the runway so you can see this. So I'm going to load the uh, flight where the plane is actually on the ground at the beginning of the runway. Because it's easier to see if we do it this way. So I want to show you the control surfaces that control pitch. What controls pitch? What controls row? What controls yaw? So here I am in the aircraft. Let's talk about pitch first. So the yoke is used to control pitch. If I push the yoke forward, the nose will go down. If I pull the yoke back, the nose will go up. What is the control surface? Well, if I zoom in here, the elevator of the plane is what is used to control the uh, control pitch. So again, if I push the yoke forward, the plane, the nose is going to go down, and you see the elevator goes down. If I pull the yoke back, the elevator goes up, which means the nose will also go up because of the way that the uh, the wind contacts the, the uh, surface of the tail there, the elevator, that control surface. So that is pitch, okay? For turns, that's obvious. Left is <laughs> left turn. So you're going to roll to the left, and then this is roll to the right. Right turns, roll to the right. The interesting thing is if you think of having your thumb, if I had my hand on this and I my thumb was sticking up, okay, if I point this way and roll to the right, the elevator, I'm sort of pointing to the elevator that should be up. So right now the, um, I said elevator, sorry, aileron. So the control surface is the aileron. So this is down, but if I'm rolling, see how it goes up. If I am banking or rolling to the left, it's up because I'm pointing my thumb that way. And then the the uh, aileron on the opposite side will do the opposite. So let me. I'm going to go outside the aircraft to make that more clear. If I am rolling to the right, my thumb on the left hand of the left side of the yoke is pointing to the right and the aileron on the right side should be up so let's look at the outside so that's more clear so here's your aileron Oop, let me back up so there's your ailerons see them they do the opposite thing as you're turning forget the <laughs> they're they're right here look at my mouse right here right there's one there's the other aileron. 
So when I'm going left, notice the left aileron is up and the right aileron is down. So it'll roll to the left. And then if I roll to the right, the right aileron is up and the left aileron is down. And so that's how that works. And then finally the yaw where we're twisting the plane left or right. So what controls that? What controls that are the pedals. So if I go inside and I push on the, which I'm twisting my yoke. I don't have foot pedals, but you can buy them for your flight simulator to make it more realistic. But you push on the left pedal then that will cause the plane to yaw to the left. And then if you push on the right pedal, it will cause the plane to twist or yaw to the right. And what controls that in terms of control service is the rudder. So as I push on the left pedal, you see the left rudder. The other rudder goes to the left, causing the plane to twist to the left. If I push the right pedal, the rudder goes to the right, causes the plane to twist or yaw to the right. So that's how that works. Now let's show that in flight. That's I wanted to show that first because it's quite honestly harder to see when you're flying. So I'm going to load pitch row yaw. And we're almost loaded. Hope I didn't lose my, it's flex, that's good. By the way, I'm doing this from an Xbox X, not a PC in case you're wondering, uh, which is handles it pretty smoothly and I'm grateful for that. So here we are, we're flying along and I'll start with the pitch. So I am pulling back, the nose goes up, pitching up. I'm pushing the yoke forward, the nose is going down. Pulling back, pitch up, push forward, pitch down. That's pitch. Okay? Again, the if I go behind the plane, you see the elevator almost again, see it's kinda hard to see. Going up. There's the elevator right here on both sides. Going down, it, it goes down, up, down. Okay, pitching up, pitching down. Then, for banking, or rolling, I'm gonna roll to the left, and then roll to the right. By the way, when you're turning, one interesting thing that as you turn, and we'll get into turns again, but as you turn, you'll notice the earth looks like it's standing still for a bit. And then when you go and roll it, looks like you're going around a clock. And that's actually accurate. <laughs> I think that's how it's done in real life as well. It just the earth looks like it's standing still. And then then you start to turn in whatever direction you're going in. So that's kind of that's kind of interesting. But uh, that's a little side note. But again, the ailerons are used to control roll. So I'm going to go back and up a little bit so we can see that. Oops, I got my flaps on. Let me turn those off. Oops, did I hit the throttle? Sure did. I accidentally hit the throttle. If I... Okay, let me uh, get the flaps up. Okay, I'm going to back this off and just go a little bit back. Okay, so as we roll to the left, the left aileron goes up and the right aileron goes down. Now, turning again, the right aileron goes up. And again, see how it's hard to see? It's just hard to see. But it is doing what I, that's why, that's why I did this on the ground because it's just a little bit hard to get your eyes on it. Left aileron up, rolling left. Right aileron up, rolling right. So we're rolling there. And then the final one is yawing. Again, that's the pedals down below. 
the van a little bit. Okay, so if I, yeah, it kind of does a weird, has a weird impact on the plane, but it's trying to twist to the left, and then it's trying to y'all twist to the right with the right uh, pedal, and again the rudder is the control surface. Let me go above it here. So I'm trying to yaw a little bit to the. Uh, I'm gonna push the left pedal off the yaw left. I'm going to push the right pedal across the yaw to the right. And the rudder is what's used to control that. We're kind of doing a fish, a fish maneuver here. <laughs> which probably making you passengers pretty sick right now. But that, those are, that's uh, essentially pitch, roll, And y'all. Pitch row y'all. And those combinations, one or more of those combinations are used in flight. So I wanted to, that's that's a high level for you tonight. I, I'm going to stop here and we're going to pick up next time. And I'll just determine what night that's going to be and put that on the schedule. But we're going to uh, start talking about how to start up the Cessna 152 from cold and dark from scratch when everything is shut down and then how to shut everything down and uh, all of that so that will be the next topic and that is uh, coming very soon so I want to thank everybody for joining tonight and appreciate your watching the channel as you get a chance and I hope that you find this helpful so wish everybody a great rest of the day weekend into the week and you guys all take care <laughs>